Hello. As I start my timer, we're going to do an hour. I swear. I'm going to do it. I am feeling worse than last week. So this, that's my disclaimer. I don't even have a disclaimer. It's just that I'm sick and I'm recording it anyway and I'm sorry. Okay? All right. So this one's called Advanced Placement in Mad Academia. It's kind of a part two to the first video about Mad Academia, okay? So I even put, and the first slide just says the title, about placement Mad Academia, but I'm switching to the second slide and it says, wait, this presentation assumes you have already seen part one, Intro to Mad Academia, which is a talk um, most recently that I gave at the University of Limerick. That's the one that's recorded, but I've done a bunch of versions of that talk. So if you've seen that talk, um, somewhere other than the Irish version, it's pretty much the same thing. So if you haven't watched that, the kind of building blocks, I'm assuming you know all that information for this talk. So if you haven't seen it, please pause here and go back and watch that presentation. I put the link where it's underlined saying that presentation but on the YouTube channel, there's only like four videos. It literally is called Intro to Mad Academia. Okay, so I'll give you a second. Okay, welcome back. Hello. Or if you've already seen it, hello again. It's really nice to have you here. Okay, so I've got your time checked itinerary. I'm going to do my best, but I am not feeling my best. I am feeling awful. But... I love an excuse to talk about this, so we're doing it anyway. The slide says, okay, so you're ready to dig deeper whew, into mad studies and mad academia. Let's go. And there are five bullet points, and one of the bullet point has two sub bullet points. So point one, two minutes. I'm going to give you a cozy space reminder. I'm not going to go over all of that every single week, so it's just going to be little reminders now. Uh, point two, medicalization in Canada that I'm going to try to do in 10 minutes or less. Um, point three, another 10 minutes on post or anti-psychiatry in Canada. Excuse me. Point four, expanding to the American and the United Kingdom context. So we're going to do the readings take up from what I had assigned you of Rose Yesha and Peter Beresford and his team. And he, they, uh, he's a social worker. She got a uh, data analytics degree, I think, in biological data mining. Um, and then point five, 20 minutes, we're going to go more advanced and more specifically into policy uh, from this book. I really love it. I got it a couple years ago. It's a little, oh, it's a little older now. It's called Care of the Mentally Disordered Offender in the Community. And I'm going to be referencing a variety of books because I have a lot of them and I might as well use them. Uh, we're going to do a little bit from that. And we're going to do a kind of bridging from what we're reading in here versus how that's playing out in real time. Okay, so I called that the real life execution reality check. Because you'll notice there's a huge difference in reality, between what we're promising or marketing about mental illness and what's actually going on at the hospital or the treatment center or the inpatient ward, okay? That's, if there's going to be one takeaway from this, it's that Canada talks a big game and does not execute any of it, okay? That's the summary in five seconds of advanced mad academia. So then I said... The end of this presentation will explain Writer's Workshop 1, which is this week, and OWL's Wellness Check-In, which is not optional. Please fill it out. It will take five minutes of your time. Not even. Please, please, please fill it out. It's already uploaded to quizzes. I will remind anyone who does not fill it out on Thursday that you, you need to. Okay? Thank you. I've also got content warnings at the end here. Uh, mostly for people in community who may or may not be watching this, who have um, certain triggers or traumas around some of these topics, but it could be good for the classroom as well. So you can take it slow or pause at will 
or get up and walk away and do sensory activities, or re-engage, disengage in whatever cycle you'd like, according to these topics. Trigger warning for suicidality, carceral policy making, institutionalization, and pharma rhetorics. And I'm not showing you pictures or anything, but I am talking about it. Okay, so please take steps to get in a place where you can decompress from that if you find that content triggering. All right, so for those of you that are still with me, this is the Cozy Space Ethicality Reminder. That's a term I made up for a facilitation style that I use in pedagogy. It basically means that I adhere to these things. I usually ask you to contribute your own um, tenants into the cozy space, but because I'm pre-recording this, I kind of can't do that. So you're kind of stuck with my ethicalities, but um, maybe in, someday I can work out a way where I can incorporate your tenants in with my tenants, even in a pre-recording. I don't know. I'll have to think more about that. So as a reminder, one is holding empathy for problems or solutions or takes or hot takes that you may not immediately agree or find empathy for. Just hold it in space. Face the gray space in terms of questions you're asking yourself in the moment, questions you're writing down to ask me, or questions you'd like to ask others. Uh, trust the self other uh, as far as the Eli Clare book goes, and I guess the Rivian bricolage, really. And then four is co-designing expertise. So I am not the sage at the front of the room. You have a lot of expertise to bring to the table, too. This is what I know from this moment in time that I am doing my best to explain to you as accessibly as possible. But part of that co-designed expertise is that I'm expecting playback from you or talk back from the community to increase all of our understandings collectively through things like your LXP, your research specialties, people or encounters you've had, etc. So this is not, you know, the 100% SARE show, um, even though it's a pre-recording and it kind of is in this moment. So just treat it like there is a talkback element to this where you can come in and have your say. Okay? So that's great. So the first part is about medicalization in Canada. And this is a complicated topic. And I think I'm going to preface every one of these topics with, this is complicated, and in order for me to explain it to you in 10 minutes, I have to be a little bit reductive about it, but I'm trying to give it as much dimension in that 10 minutes as possible. So please just proceed with the caveat that I know that it's a little bit reductive just for temporality's sake, okay? So the slide says medicalization in Canada, and then there's a subtitle that says problematizing contemporary medical paradigms. And contemporary in this context kind of means post-2000, uh, as opposed to, you know, postmodernism versus contemporary. Postmodernism kind of picks up in the 1980s. I've gone a little bit further than that because the difference between 80s policy and 2000s policy is bonkers, and we could do an hour just on that. So I've kind of deleted that and gone from 2000 to 2020, because that's just easier, okay? So if you want to talk about pre-2000, we can do that too. You'll just have to ask that as a question on the Monday Talkback, okay? So I've got <laughs> medicalization in five minutes, and a lot of this is from, I'll show you, so that if you're really interested in this stuff, I'll, I'll tell you where I get my intel. <laughs> Um, I really love this textbook. I was on a wait list for the release of this as a reviewer. I love it to death. It's the eighth edition of Health, Illness, and Medicine in Canada. It's the standard textbook for social work and pre-med, and that one just came out in 2021, so it's newly updated and everything, and it's, it's a treat. I love this book. It's expensive. Get someone with money to buy it for you. Okay, find someone who won a shirt and get them to buy it because that book's like $230 or something. The other one that's good for 
medicalization, more so the anti-psychiatry angle. Bonnie Burstow, she's at U of T. She publishes like the most content on this in the Canadian context ever. She did a book specifically on epistemology and trying to um, quantitatively account for what happened when. And it was called Psychiatry and the Business of Madness. And a lot of that picked up, and I don't have all my books unpacked. I still have like three bins of books still to unpack. But one of these books is called, um, oh, damn. Mad, Mad Matters. It was an anthology on mad studies. And one of the chapters on that was very similar to this, where it was accounting for the money and the time and the ways in which we spend on convincing people of how good Canada's mental health care is. Really great article. This book kind of picks up from that article, from Mad Matters, which I will show you if it ever gets unpacked. Great Canadian <laughs> anthology from like 2016. Okay, these other ones come later. So, based on all of that, plus regular articles, we could say, reductively, that biomedicalization is accused of lacking the social dimension and clinical iatrogenesis as like, in five seconds, that's what we're talking about. So lacking social dimension, a lot of CDS gang will be familiar with this one. It's kind of like the argument we were talking about um, with the medical model versus the social model of disability. And the caveat to this example is that, A, talking about just disability is very different from talking about all of medicalization in general. So then you're talking about things like obesity clinicians or high blood pressure clinicians, mental illness clinicians. Uh, and those are all complicating factors. But there's a relationship between the medical versus social model of disability, which in itself is problematic, and the medical versus social model of um, biomedical, I don't know, output, how we treat people once they come into GP programming. So if we treat biomedicalization kind of like the social model versus biomedical model program, it goes way, way, way on the side of medical model. The medical system in Canada is very, very slow to pick up on social factors the same way that social workers might or um, nurses might, etc. And this is changing. And Shane Nielsen will talk about that when we have him as a speaker. He currently teaches at the medical school at McMaster, and he spends a lot of time with the biomedicalization and neoliberalization relationships. So you'll hear from him directly about this. So the second point says, over-prescribing for social problems. Example, medicalizing anxiety, antipsychotics for kids. Sometimes this gets called pharmaceuticalization, but it's it's a player in the medicalization argument. So I'm sure, you know, you've seen news articles about, oh my god, everyone we know is on drugs, or oh my goodness, as soon as I walked into the doctor's office, I was there 30 seconds and they prescribed me medication. That's part of what's called the over-prescribing problem, and I'm not going to go into the debate because there are very good reasons why some things are being prescribed more as opposed to less. But there's also a ton of reasons why we rely on prescribing instead of treating the social problem, which goes back to the biomedicalization versus the social problem. So a way of being super reductive about over-prescribing could maybe be that instead of dealing with a problem that a client presents with intersectionally or including things like social conditions, racial conditions, ethnic conditions, environmental conditions, um, they're honing in on the symptoms presenting and they're prescribing irregardless of every other point in this scenario. And you can see how that's a problem. 
And I'm not saying that happens to everybody. And I'm not saying that they're doing it on purpose. I am saying it occurs and it occurs more than occasionally. It is recursively. Okay? So that's pharmaceuticalization in a nutshell. A uh, healthism and neoliberal late stage capitalism. This will again go back to, you know, Shane's going to do a whole lecture on this. Um, but in a nutshell, neoliberalization kind of encourages in a problematic way, total self-sufficiency at any cost and anything is achievable if you have enough money and you're trying hard enough. So something that came about in the 2000s, um, which they called healthism, was kind of trying, if you're a video gamer, to kind of min-max your stats. And if you're not a video gamer, it means, you know, if I've been putting a ton of energy into schoolwork and a ton of energy into my family relationships, but my exercise could be 20% better. It's already okay. I go for a run every 30 minutes, but I could run for an hour or I could run for an hour and go to the gym and things like Instagram uh, makes that, I wanted to say fucks that up, but Instagram fucks around with healthism, um, social media in general, all the blog -a type apps, um, the app market in general, there's so many fitness apps and there was the whole Peloton thing last year. They make that a very individualized issue. Like if you're not as healthy as all these people on Peloton, that's a you problem and you can fix that with money and attention. And the problem with that paradigm is that it disregards kind of like pharmaceuticalization, every other circumstance that stops you from being those people on Peloton. So it, it disregards everything other than you're not doing it, so it's your fault. And we have a whole week on that, so don't worry, we'll come back to that. The medical industrial complex, which I think there's another slide on. In a nutshell, that's the relationship between the pharmaceutical industry or all the industries that create um, the items that get used in medical establishments, like Stryker is a big one. They make all the um, beds and all that stuff that goes in hospitals. Um, but the relationships between these companies almost makes the hospital operate like a company. And going back to the neoliberalism article, you don't want your hospital to be treating patients like employees or like company models, because that starts to make care first very complicated. If you make money first, but then care, your ethic which the medical industrial complex basically argues that's what's happening. You're making money as a hospital, but then also you're saving people if you have the funds. Um, that's really bad. And that's particularly bad for disabled people, mentally ill people, people that aren't white, anybody intersectionally that doesn't fit into being profitable to save. The medical industrial complex is not a good sign for you. Okay, so I'm almost through this one. Medicine is one of the primary agents of social control. If you take that to be true, which a lot of people do, um, and that's a kind of Foucaultian take on the medical industry, uh, this got a lot worse in COVID, right? Because medicalization became such a big part of daily life. So this social control through COVID is now extra able to tie itself tightly to pharma and to the medical education system. And this has been happening for a hundred years, but it has exploded in coronavirus because we are so reliant on it. And there are many reasons why it's a good thing to be reliant on science, but there's also a lot of bad things about giving med ed and pharma and the health sector too much control over what people can think, say, and do. That's the argument 
of socially controlled medicine. Um, and Michel Foucault is obviously relevant to that. And it's a lot more complicated than that. I'm just summing it up. But if you take medicine as a bureaucracy, as a way to describe its power relationship, Foucault does a really good job, um, not only in Sex and Sexuality, but another book that he did, whose name I cannot recall. I think it was literally called Mental Illness or something. Um, of describing how this top-down structure essentially creates ways to eliminate people from getting care in this kind of business-first, hyper-neoliberalist paradigm, where we only save people who will cause recursive profit or will it'll pay off to save them. Right? Okay. Uh, not to say I agree with any of that, I'm just explaining it. So if I were to give you a couple examples of medicalization in five minutes, uh, the Psychiatric Times ran a story last year, uh, and this is about the MAID bill, C7, which we have a whole week on because C7 is wild. We could talk the entire course about the MAID bill, but we're only doing it for one week. So really quickly, the headline from the Psychiatric Times says, first, do no harm. New Canadian law, that's the MAID bill, allows for assisted suicide for patients with psychiatric disorders. So it used to, this is the euthanasia law, if you're not familiar with it. And we were trying to copy a couple European countries like the Netherlands, who had really broad euthanasia laws. And there were a lot of really good reasons for that. Um, the problem is when we started the debate over whether or not people with severe mental illness or SMI class illness were allowed to opt into MAID. So they could say, during a crisis break, I'm no longer willing to live DNR me, do not resuscitate. And there are a whole heck of a lot of problems with making that legal, okay? So I'll save the rest of that for next week because we have a whole week on it. Don't worry. Another one, this is from, and this is a little older now. I think this came out in 2016, but the Canada Health Ethics Board or something did a whole 200 page book on like, here's what we understand about mental illness and mood disorders. It was not a good showing. I don't think anyone's surprised by that. So what I'd like you to notice um, is the stigma section. And I took schizophrenia just because I'm biased, but you could do this exercise with anything they wrote about. The screen cap says, public misunderstanding and fear contribute to the serious stigma associated with schizophrenia. Contrary to popular opinion, most individuals with the disorder are withdrawn and not violent. Indeed, when adequately treated, people with schizophrenia are no more violent than the general population. Nonetheless, the stigma of violence interferes with an individual's ability to acquire housing, employment, and treatment, and also compounds difficulties in social relationships. These stereotypes also increase the burden of families and caregivers. This was super, super forward thinking for a variety of reasons, and it was immediately negated by the page immediately previous and the page that comes immediately after, because it gives you a table um, equating, you know, if you're schizophrenic, you are almost definitely going to be homeless, you are almost definitely going to be alcoholic, you are almost definitely going to be drug dependent, which kind of flies in the face of the social relationship they're drawing here, uh, which tries to take schizophrenia in more of a social model approach, where they're saying, because of all this stigma, and because people are so afraid of them, they're not able to acquire these resources. But then they publish tables saying, oh man, but schizophrenics, they are heckin' addicted to drugs and heckin' addicted to alcohol. And that's kind of re reifying the stigma, right? Because people aren't going to take away 
the little blurb that you had about stigma, people are going to take away the three pages of tables you had about how drug dependent and addictive and annoying they are to take care of, right? So that's the documentation we're getting in the mental illness sector. I'll give you another example from the same booklet. So I took their symptom chart uh, to show what's called the polarity of symptomatization. Um, and this is from the DSM-4, not 5. Uh, 5, I'll talk about it next week, but 5 basically lists like any human emotion ever for any disorder <laughs> could be symptomatic of X disorder. So 4 uh, stays a little closer to what they think might actually be going on. So schizophrenia only has 5 traits that you can look for, and they do this little score sheet when they're looking for evidence of disorder. Um, so on your score sheet for schizophrenia, you get delusions, hallucinations, lack of motivation, social withdrawal, thought disorders. We got lack of insight. That's coming back. We did a lecture about that last week. Um, compare that to the symptomology for depression or bipolar 1, where you get depressed mood, feeling worthless, feeling hopeless, loss of interest, changing in appetite, you can't sleep, decreased energy, sense of worthlessness, thoughts of death, poor concentration. Um, and a lot of people astutely made the point that if you wait long enough, you know, in a, in a course of 30 days, at least one or two of those days, you're going to feel a whole heck of a lot of those symptoms. That is normal human emotion. And where it becomes disorder is if you're feeling it every single day. But a, increasingly, if you're feeling it at all, or for four days in a row, they will give you depression medication. And that's an issue because we are medicalizing feeling the full spectrum of human emotions. And the argument you know, it's a little more complicated than that. I'm not saying everyone who feels depression, depression just needs to get over it. But I'm also saying, you know, the overprescription issue is particularly pronounced in a condition like depression, where there are about 10,000 symptoms listed, and pretty much everyone in the call, or everyone listening to this video, could probably qualify today for depression medication. Does that make medicating it okay? I'm not sure. I'm not sure how much we should be prescribing, you know, chemicals that change your brain composition every time someone has a bad couple months. But there are plenty of good arguments to the contrary, which is why this is a continuing area of study, right? You can do the same thing with bipolar disorder. I'm going to move on because I'm pretty sure I'm already over time. I am way over time, so we're going to go faster. <laughs> this is post in anti-psychiatry, and I put a disclaimer here because I, I feel like it even should have come quicker than this. But for anti-psychiatry, there are so many ways in the media that this gets taken up as being completely anti-medication and anti-treatment. That is not what anti or post psychiatry is. I really need you to understand that. It is not no one should take medication ever for anything. That's super reductive and just not what's happening. So I wrote on the slide, anti-psychiatry, this is really complicated. Please do not take from this presentation that psychotherapy, psychopharmaceuticals, or other professional interventions are wrong or wholly compromised, or that I'm giving you advice not to seek medical care. That is not what's happening. Please heed this warning. Okay. So, if I did poster anti-psychiatry in five minutes, which is what I'm going to try to do, I'm just going to fly through this slide and you can pause whenever you need it, okay? Drugs and life-saving care is extremely lucrative. That goes back to what we were saying about the neoliberalization or the medical industrial complex of medicine. It is really, really, really problematic that pharmaceuticals are extremely, extremely lucrative. And this year, I think it was this January, there was a, 
there was a really funny documentary on Amazon Prime called Pharma Bro about the kind of most infamous person to come out of this paradigm, Martin Shkreli. And he got famous for taking a life-saving, oh gosh, I think it was like a diabetes drug or something in America. And he put the price up overnight to like $4,800 from something that was only about $100. And that's legal. He is totally allowed to do that. But the moral outcry of that pointed to some of the problems that are culminating as a result of letting pharmacy advertise to doctors, but also the relationship between the hospital and pharmaceuticals as being increasingly neoliberal and bureaucratic. That is a huge, huge, huge issue. And a lot of medical schools are talking about that right now. Okay? So then you have blockbuster drugs and patenting drugs. Patenting, there's nothing wrong with that in theory. If someone invents a drug that's able to cure X, they should totally get the credit and get to profit from all that time they spent trying to develop it. The problem with patented medications is that it creates the excuse for people like Martin, Martin Shkreli to charge thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars for that specific pill, and there is no law saying he can't do that. They can charge, if it's your patent, whatever you want, anything under the sun, even if it's actively killing people. That's fine, because it's your patent. <sighs> which is a shame. Blockbuster drugs is the phenomenon of household name drugs. So things like Viagra, Ativan, benzos, and all the sub-benzo classes. Um, most people have heard of Seroquel. Most people have heard of Cicloprem. All the ones, the drug name that you immediately recognize is called a blockbuster drug, and they are generally patented more expensive, and prescribed at much higher rates than drugs that can present the same effects and are less expensive, but people don't know them. So you can see how all these problems are starting to create this kind of cycle of harm, right? I, I know you're sitting there putting it together as I'm going through this. So the commercialization of the 90s, and I know this is a little bit pre-2000s, but it kind of started 10 years earlier and then really boomed in the mid-aughts. So in the 90s, Americans started advertising prescription drugs on their channels. And I know Canadians <laughs> will sometimes point this out when they're watching American channels on TV and they're like, why on earth are they advertising a bipolar medication to me? Because that's legal. Under the DTCA <laughs> in America, Canada, that's not legal. So if you're watching a Canadian channel, they cannot directly advertise or from patent to player a drug. They can advertise, this is how they get around it, at doctor's offices. So you'll see all those posters for drugs and medications and you can get pamphlets there, but they cannot televise that to you. So the other way that they get around that is by marketing straight to the physicians themselves. So every year there's conferences where physicians and GPs and nurse practitioners and etc. can go and they talk to drug manufacturers. And I want you to feel panic already at, at how not good that is. So they talk to these drug manufacturers and their job, these are basically drug lobbyists, is to convince the physician to be prescribing their drug for X condition. So then they cannot offer bribes, but there's kind of a funny loophole there where you, the drug manufacturer can offer incentives to doctors or clinics that are able to prescribe a drug at a certain frequency. So if you're selling X amount per month, we can give you 1% back of the money we made from this. And that's 
such a problem. I can't describe to you how large of a problem that is. That should scare the shit out of you. I hope it is. So that kickback creates incentives for doctors to be prescribing that specific medication as opposed to the generic. And the generic is generally the most accessible drug on the market, okay? So then we've got drug scandals. Oh, I skipped something. Hold on. Canada's health budget spends more on Schedule F. Schedule F is um, prescription class. That means anything you need somebody to actually write down and a pharmacist needs to double check that you actually receive that prescription, that's a Schedule F drug. And we do, to some degree, under the Ontario Health Plan, subsidize some of the cost. I could do a whole lecture on just everything wrong with how we currently subsidize because it disproportionately leaves out SMI class medications. It really does. Um, Schedule F drugs are more expensive to Canada's health budget than every single physician making their physician budget, generally sunshine list budgets, in the country. We spend more subsidizing drugs than on every single doctor in Canada. That's an issue. Drug scandals. We had Yasmin, the birth control that made some people infertile. We had thalidomide, which was, I think it was meant to be another kind of birth control drug, but it, it was warping newborn babies. Hormone replacement therapy, that was a whole thing. Lipitor, Diane 35 was also warping people's uh, bodies. Vioxx, uh, benzo class drugs and opioids. The opioids thing in five seconds was that the drug manufacturer was aware of how addictive opioid class medications were. And when they were um, marketing the drug to vendors at those conventions I was talking about, when they were talking to doctors about it, they chose not to tell doctors that the opioids were extremely addictive. They buried that data. So now we have what's called the opioid crisis, which has been going on a whole lot longer than, um, you know, the crisis will make it look. But the crisis came about because that pharmaceutical manufacturer wanted to sell as many of them as possible lucrative industry and then when it came out how addictive they were, it was already too late. There were hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people addicted and willing to die for that drug. So that was really, really horrible. And there's news about the not only the opioid crisis, but drug scandals all the time. All the time. Um, so the accessibility of pharmacists is greater than that of GPs. You are 10 times more able to get in touch with a pharmacist than you can get a primary care physician. This is especially true in Ontario, but it also, you know, shows you the marketization of the medical industry, right? The people selling you things are a lot more accessible than the people able to diagnose and prescribe care, okay? And forced scarcity shortages and burying non-sponsored studies. So the opioid thing was a good example of that, where if, if the pharm pharmaceutical company themselves was not the sponsor of the study, they would pay people to bury the study. So that data of how addictive opioids were was extremely difficult to get a hold of. And we see that over and over again with drug scandal medications where they were actually proving a little bit in advance of when the news broke that there's a huge problem with this drug, but the ability to bury studies is unreal. It, it's too easy to do it. The forced scarcity shortages, that goes back, that's something that Martin Shkreli did too, where he will purposely hold back supply so that the price will increase because demand doesn't meet supply. That's legal. He's allowed to do that. And Pharma Bro was about, you know, the moral problem of that. But in a capitalist culture, you know, kind of part of the argument was who are we to tell him he can't profit from his medication? And I think if you are at all not morally bankrupt, 
you're probably on the side of you should not be able to create forced scarcity with medication, right? Okay. So, really quickly, we'll do the readings take up. Oh my goodness, I only have 20 minutes. Um, so here we go. We're going to read from Rose and from Peter. Both of them super, 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 super phenomenal theorists. Can't say enough good things about them. Love them to death in real life, too. Rose is a PhD in information systems, health informatics, and behavioral health analytics. That's neat. Peter Beresford is a social worker. He's got OBE, FACSS, FRSA, and he does a ton of outreach work specifically in uh, co-designed methodology or co-production. Okay? So Rose's article was called Access Denied, and it was, a, it was an uh, anti-psychiatry article about some of the undiscussed harms of what's called the psychiatry survivors movement. So I wanted you to get a glimpse into that world, because if you're not specifically looking for it, the survivors movement can be kind of difficult to come across. Okay, so really quickly, the bullet points here, psychiatry's relationship to class which should strike you as pretty obvious. Many prescriptions are huge money, therapy's huge money, and your alternative is tough it out. So there's a lot we could say about that, right? PCSX movement or MAD movement uh, and survivorship. So there are a ton of people, particularly in the MAD movement, who do see surviving the pharmaceutical industry or the psychiatry industry as the most apt. Word. And I'm not saying I agree or disagree with that, but I do think the probability that you're running into people who are not taking your lived experience as the most important point in the equation of your care um, is disproportionately high. It is happening more often than not that your lived experience comes pretty far down the list of considerations from your care team. And that's a problem. That's a lot of what the MAD movement's about. So with that, you get things like antipsychotic withdrawal, which is infamously terrible, and they prescribe you very little to get around that. Uh, and drug tapering, which is when you're coming off and on serious medications. It fucks you up. That's my summary. <laughs> The answer to debilitating medication side effects, so if you're on a psychotropic or you're trying to titrate up and down, you'll get these horrible, horrible drug withdrawal symptoms. And a lot of these drug withdrawal symptoms are what we're seeing when we're being reductive about homeless people or drug addicts. It's just as likely with these classes of people that they're coming off of prescription medication that they were told will help them. And then when they start having adverse reactions to that, they're told they're drug seeking, they're told they're drug addicts, they're told they're in drug withdrawal. This is what happens a lot with the people who die of opioid abuse. So they're given it for as a legitimate pain management prescription and the cycle of addiction starts. And when you get those terrible debilitating side effects, it presents as pretty much the same as being in heroin withdrawal. And people can't tell. And that's an issue. So they mitigate this with, here we go, more prescriptions that are specifically designed to mitigate the side effects of prescriptions you were already given and are now addicted to. So now you're getting what's called doubling down, where you're given medication to help you take this medication, but if you stop taking either of them, things are gonna go downhill really, really fast for you. And then in the event you do run out of money or become homeless or become problematically addicted, our society treats you as a criminal as a result of that. So that's a really hard road. Um, gaslighting and re-diagnosis recursion. So I'll show you a bunch of examples of people who it was all in their head um, and they couldn't get help and they kept getting sicker and sicker because they couldn't get help because nobody believed them because of the pharmaceutical withdrawal symptoms they were already experiencing. Really, really bad. Um, 
From Ivan Illich, this is a quote from the article, Clinical Iatrogenesis as the Injury Done to Patients by Ineffective, Toxic, and Unsafe Treatments. He described the need for evidence-based medicine two decades before the term was coined. So iatrogenesis is basically you're being harmed by the care that you were told would fix you. Um, and I just gave you, I guess, a bunch of examples of that. You know, getting addicted to opioids, you can make an argument, is iatrogenic. Okay? So then we go to Peter Beresford. He did a whole article on listening to co-production, which was a response to studies that were coming out saying, I don't really get the benefit of co-production or co-design. So he wrote this whole manifesto like, let me tell you exactly what you're not getting. So the summary of that is co-design is just starting to gain influence. This is like the mid-teens, early 20s, where people are actually taking co-design seriously in the medical sector uh, and in the social work sector, particularly the mental health subsector. It's a really hot time for co-design in mental health right now, and a lot of that co-design is being executed in a way... Um, the response article calls it copiquity, where a lot of people are doing it, but they're not doing it in good faith, or they're doing it to be virtue signaling. So they'll create these panels of lived experience people who are able to advise based on their life history and based on being on these drugs or based on being in that situation, what worked in that situation. And a lot of times what's happening is that the people in power positions in those roles listens to the council, says, right, thank you for your input, and then goes ahead and does what they wanted to do, but they get to publish or they get to say to the government, we used a panel. So it looks like they were getting advice and cooperating with people with LXP to come up with the best possible solution. But the panel wasn't actually being used because they ignored the advice because they have no contract saying, I must implement what you're saying. So that's really dishonest. Um, the whole article kind of asks, why don't we prioritize or clinically assess LXP? Why don't we use people's qualitative experiences in line with quantitative data? That's a whole lecture. That goes back to what we were saying about the social model. Um, I'm going to skip the rest of this because I'm running out of time. And I think there are other slides in the slideshow that make these points. But you can take them down and ask me about them directly on Monday if you want to know more about that. So the other two points are important, but I'm going to keep going. All right. So I'm going to go to Advanced Madness. <laughs> I know. It was already kind of a lot, but... Now we're getting like nitty gritty. So this will all come from, I love this book. This was awesome. This was from the mental health, uh, the M MHCC show from 2019. I picked up Canadian landmark cases in forensic mental health. Forensic mental health is a fancy way of saying uh, when we go to court and talk about the problems with mental illness. So criminally mental ill. Which goes back to mentally disordered offenders, obviously. We're also going to use Madness, Violence, and Power. That's a really good one. It's a critical collection about the relationship between neoliberalism, um, madness as a means of saying SMI class illness, and um, carcerality, or whether or not there is violent or... Um, in need of being institutionalized as much as we say they are. Also relevant to the conversation, Margaret Price, Mad at School. She's great. That's the rhetorics of madness within um, academic context. And there's, there's a whole lot more we could use, but we're going to use these. So with how many minutes? With 10 minutes left, I'm going back to a combination of the glancy text and if I can unbury it, the mentally disordered offender text. And you can tell just from the title that I'm going to have a field day with this text because as soon as you call them a mentally disordered offender, I'm already ready to throw down. 
but we had 300 and something pages about policy from pretty much the entire Western world about forensic psychiatry and titration and triage for severe mental illness and how our solution to that right now in 2022 is essentially jailing them or carceral looping. So ever since deinstitutionalization in the 70s, your options are basically cope, have enough money to take meds, you don't have enough money or you're addicted, you go to jail, you go to the hospital, hospital kicks you back to jail, you might get to go back to the hospital, you get released, so deinstitutionalized again, but you don't have the resources to support yourself, and you loop, right? That's what's happening a lot with SMI class illness, and that's why they are so critically overrepresented in uh, prison populations. It's not because they're more violent or they do more crime. We're not giving them the resources to break that cycle in a nutshell, in five seconds, and we could talk about that more. So from the mentally disordered offender text, we've got treatment enforcement and risk assessment have seen tons and tons and tons of disproportionate amount of policy development in the 2000s. So we went from deinstitutionalization, which basically said, I don't think we should be pretend jailing them anymore. And then we thought, okay, but there's still a lot of homeless people and a lot of crime. That doesn't look good for us. How are we going to assess risk? And the forensic assessment of risk is basically psychiatrists taking qualitative guesses at how violent someone presents. That is not a good reason to jail people, in a nutshell. Right? Especially when considering that I have in the second point here that crime is a construct. So even things like being gay used to be a crime. You could be jailed for that. Being alcoholic used to be, it kind of still is, a crime. You could be jailed for that. We had debtors jail. If you owed people too much money, prison. Our answer, more often than not, to any kind of societal zeitgeist that is um, that's unpopular or presents a problem for richer or middle class people, jail. So that's not good. So if we take as a given that crime is socially constructed, which it is, forensic risk assessment is not quantitative, which basically means you can't crunch a bunch of numbers and assess with accuracy if Johnny on the stand is going to get out of jail and kill two people. It can't be done. But all of these forensic risk assessment techniques make it seem quantitative so that people are more comfortable with that outcome. And a lot of the MAD movement is about trying to get within that harm construct and stopping some of that with things like ACT teams or community care teams or safe injection sites, stuff like that. SMI class and violence is pretty much a societal truism. Um, you guys might be more educated as people in disability, but generally um, the average citizen draws a direct line between serious mental illness and propensity for violence. And kind of the most famous example of that that keeps rendering itself over and over again was Columbine in America. As soon as we were able to say the Columbine shooters were definitely mental ill, every single time something violent happened, we kind of Columbined it and said they were mentally ill. And you get entire shows about that. Criminal Minds is basically the show about <laughs> diagnosing which mental illness a certain violent person in society has. I fucking hate that show. And most of them, for whoever's keeping score, are schizophrenic. It's such a problem. Stop that. Um, and because we take SMI class plus violence to be a societal truism, particularly in the American context, whenever gun debates school shooters, parental reassignment comes up, 
it's pretty much ubiquitous that five minutes after that conversation starts, someone will bring up, well, what about crazy people? Or what about mentally ill people? Or psychotic people? They are the reason why we have carcerality, or why we have metal detectors in American schools, or why we have um, less restrictive gun laws. And that's a huge, huge, huge problem. The relationship that's really difficult to break between illness and violence, and illness and particularly gun violence. Okay? And a lot of that is American context, but you'll see it in Canadian articles too. So don't let us get away with saying it's just America, because it's not. So then I wrote, Mad Studies is very concerned with the after effects of risk-focused care, which is our current model of forensic evaluation, and preventative pharmacare, which is our current model of prescription narcotics, essentially. So risk-focused care is given um, based on the forensic evaluation of their propensity for violence. And if they're deemed violent, they are put back into the carceral looping cycle. Um, the problem with risk-focused care is, A, that is not a science, nor is it an art. That's professional guessing. Um, but B, it should be harm minimization care. So instead of focusing on whether or not they're going to harm everyone around them, the first item they should be thinking about is how to make them more stable as individuals, right? And that seems obvious when I say it like that. I know, but that is not the current model. Our current model is not what's called harm minimization. But the modeling for the things highlighted in purple at the bottom, those are modeled directly on what's called the harm minimization care model. So street teams, uh, ACT and community care, LXP advisory panels, safe injection sites, those are very of the moment or of the last 10 years harm minimizing policies. And they are not as popular as we'd like them to be because we are so interested in risk-focused care. So the same thing you can say about preventative pharmacare. What we're, where we should be is harm minimization pharmacare. So what is going to give them the best life experience based on what we can prescribe or de-prescribe now? Um, it's very much about prevention instead. So instead of giving someone, you know, Latuda for schizophrenia, they they might think about doing a more nuclear class like Haldol, where like we will definitely see preventative effects if we give them complete obliteration antipsychs, right? That's an example in a nutshell. So I'm giving you a couple screen caps from the Bradley report. I'm pretty much going to skip this one because I'm out of time, but the Bradley Report was a really famous UK study about um, basically this, about how we deal with SMI class illness in British society. It was a riot. Um, so I'm going to give you a couple examples, and then I'm going to tell you your homework. So from, I think this is 2021. Yes, it is. January 2021. So this is not long ago. Okay, and I even have an example from 2022. The headline in the screen capture says video captures patient crawling out of hospital after staff dismiss pleas for help. Someone who was bipolar went to an Ontario hospital. I think it was Northern Ontario. And oh my goodness, I'm out of time. Don't worry, I'm almost done. Uh, they presented at the hospital described excruciating pain in their legs and they were being treated until they disclosed that they had bipolar 2. That was a big issue. So I took a couple lines out of this column. It said video cameras at the excerpt captured Pontone as he was ordered to leave. The footage shows Pontone lying on the hallway floor struggling to stand. Remember because he presented with excruciating pain 
in his legs. So he can't walk right now. Um, as he gets to his hands and knees and crawls toward the exit, a nurse walks next to him, escorting him out. Passersby stop to look at the spectacle, but the nurse encourages Pontone to keep going. The nurse kept saying, you're a big boy. You're strong. Come on, big boy, stand up. It took Pontone about 20 minutes to reach the exit of the emergency room. A security guard helped him into a taxi. And this blew up. <laughs> in the news when the video went live because Pontone really did have excruciating pain in his legs and he was admitted back to the hospital later. But because he had disclosed that he had serious mental illness when he presented at the ER, they didn't believe him and they forced him to crawl out of the ER. That's one example of thousands of stories like this every year. Another one from July 2021. Black student refused care twice at Canadian Hospital. This was in Saskatchewan. During a mental health crisis, is found dead in the lake. Hours later, family alleges suicide. They didn't care. So the first two paragraphs sums up the whole story. A black man is dead by possible suicide, and they still say possible. Which bothers me, but here we go. After attempting to seek help from a local hospital more than once for mental health related issues and being refused. And his family points to racism as the reason behind the tragedy. Samuel Uko, a 20 year old college football player took his life in May, 2020 after multiple attempts to receive treatment. So he went to the ER for depression, anxiety, and sleeping issues. Yuko arrived at Regina General Hospital, that's in Saskatchewan, twice on the 21st, clearly stating he needed help and was mentally ill, which was captured on video. After being turned away both times, his body was found in Wiscona Lake. His death was ruled a suicide by drowning, and now his family are suing, which they should. So you tell people to go to the hospital, to go seek care. Not a lot of people are following up and seeing what happened when people go seek that care. And you're going to be really upset by what happens when people go seek care. This is one from last week. Toronto Star. Half of people who died from opioids in 2020 sought health care in the month before. People who are tweaking out, dying of opioid addiction, which was prescribed to them intentionally as something that was going to be pain relieving. So they got legitimate prescriptions for these drugs without knowing how addictive they were. They go to the hospital to say they're addicted, they're sick, they're ill, they need help, they're turned away, and they die over and over and over again because of the stigma around drug addiction. Awful. Keep watching that news. It keeps happening. And I said that, it keeps happening. These are the stories I remembered from last year, but every month there's a new story about someone presenting with an SMI class illness who isn't believed, who's killed in the psychiatric ward, who dies of suicide while in inpatient care, which should, <laughs> by policy, that should be impossible, but it keeps happening. People refused care and completing suicide, people getting addicted to prescription drugs and basically orchestrating suicide from our refusal to give them care. It's happening over and over and over. Are the policies getting better or are we declining care to people we think are hopeless to bolster policy effectiveness? So people like Cam H will report that this many people went on the drug and this many people improved, and those numbers keep going up. But you can't explain that when looking at these stories. So one way of explaining that is by not recording or declining care to people that they think can't be helped. That's a great way to get your numbers up and not acknowledge the social model. So if you wanna keep talking about that, this is my information. If you're in my DS class, um, please keep watching. I'm going to show you about the writer's workshop. If you're from Mad Community, thank you for sitting through this. I appreciate you. I love you. Please find decompression resources or contact me directly. 
for DS students, this is the writer's workshop. It's a team activity. It says on the slide, you should have finished three write space assignments by the time you watch this video. So that's the time bending, trailblazer, and trailblazer self. If that does not describe your current situation, please try to get those in this week on Crip Time, okay? I will accept them until this Friday when we're handing in everything else. So your instructions for this week, you're not doing a right space, you're doing a workshop. And I've adjusted the expectation to be in line with had I asked you to write a shorter right space. So you're only editing one team member's assignment for this because you had to watch two lectures, okay? So the instructions say, pick your strongest right space. That's up to you, whichever one you think you could polish for submission toward your portfolio at the end of the semester. So it can be one, two, or three. Um, on your team text channel, upload that right space into the chat. And I'll, I left the instructions here, but I'll also show you. So this is my Discord window with a couple of my friends. Um, you're going to click, if I make this a little bigger, you see all the channels on the left-hand side here. You're going to go to your um, team's channel. And I'm not doing this on your channel because I don't want people online to see your names. You're going to click the plus. That's right here where my mouse is indicating. You're going to go to upload a file. All kinds of files are going to come up, right? So I'm going to click a book review I did, Healing Resistance, uh, and then you press enter. That enters the file into your chat, okay? And you can download the file by clicking the download button, right? So now I have my book review from last year, okay? So there you go. Um, that's what you're going to do on your Teams text channel. Upload that as soon as you can. Monday or Tuesday, preferably, so that your other team members have the whole week to edit, okay? So select a valid docx or PDF, or if you're on a Mac, I don't even know what the file's called. Your team needs to edit at least one teammate's entry. So everyone on your team needs to edit someone's work. So if there's four people on your team, all of you are trading one-to-one. -one right? If there's five people on your team, someone needs to kind of take one for the team and edit two people's because that's an uneven number. But there's two more workshops. So you can also switch who has to do two for each workshop, right? So everybody needs to edit someone's and everybody needs to receive an edit from someone. And you have to work this out with your team. And you can do that on the Discord channel. You can do that on Facebook chat. I don't care, okay? It might help to do it on the Discord channel because if something goes wrong, you can tag me in and say, this is what happened. Please help us figure this out, okay? And I said, please be more mindful of the timeline this week because it's not fair to your teammates if everybody else gets an edit except the person you were supposed to edit for. So if you can, if it's possible for you, don't take crypt time on team activity weeks. We can work out your individual assessments a lot easier than trying to work out all five people not getting feedback. So please do your best to be on time this week if that's possible for you. If it's not possible for you, please tell me directly. Okay, because I need to work out for your teammates where they're going to get their edits. Okay, so I wrote here, everyone on your team needs to evaluate a right space and everyone on your team needs an evaluator. This will require you to talk to each other to make a community action plan. So I'm forcing you to interact, but I'm hoping through that interaction, completing that workshop worksheet, that you'll actually want to talk to these people more often. You know, it's part of community building. So the worksheet I will post in the announcement channel, but it's also already uploaded onto your OWL. When you get someone's right space, you're going to fill out the questions on the workshop worksheet about their assignment. So then you're uploading the workshop worksheet 
to your text channel by Friday at midnight, okay, for your team. So you're going to give it to them back so they can see their feedback, so they can edit it, but you're also going to upload your worksheet to the assessment box in OWL so that I can see you did it, okay? Writer's Workshop is worth 20% of your course grade. Don't skip this activity. <laughs> There's three of them, but that's heavy. Please also complete the OWL's wellness check-in. It's a five-minute survey. If you do not have it done on Thursday night, I will ping you to remind you, okay? But I need those answers, okay? Awesome. That's everything from me. Thank you for sitting through this, and I'll see you on Monday.